You're watching this special edition of One on One, exclusive to PLOS TV Africa, with Professor Wale Shoinka, the second in a trilogy of rich and stimulating conversations. Okay, so we've just been talking about uh, ethnic consciousness and why mm. it's a positive thing if, mm. if harnessed in the right way. Um, but I just want to this, I read recently, or I was referred to uh, somewhere where you wrote about, you lamented, if you, I, I believe it was you, that we are, it's pathetic how we're allowing ourselves to be divided over issues of tribalism and religion mm -hmm. by the elite ruling or governing class mm -hmm. who are much more united in their own purpose than we, the masses. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want you to talk about that a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, why are we so easily baited by matters of religion mm -hmm. and ethnicity and that keeps us somehow in, inefficient when it comes to political activism? Yeah. You know, the first thing is that we live all these beliefs naturally anyway. In other words, the Christian is a Christian in spite of tribe. Okay. A, a Yoruba is a Yoruba in spite of religion. So these are elementary aspects of our being which we take for granted. Now, when we come together uh, and interact with others from different descriptive uh, units, and there is just a little disagreement, it takes us back to what I said earlier, that people then retreat into their own lager, so to speak, their own bunkers, and say, okay, let's see what advantage I can derive from this sense of community, from these various loyalties, allegiances against the others. But basically, we don't live such hostility. No. We meet, a, you know, a Muslim meets somebody on the marketplace, and what counts at that moment is the market price, is the haggling. What do you have? How do we exchange? There's quite a lot. As you were talking, I have so many angles I want to explore, so I'll just... I'll put them to one side and, okay. and just ask the question most prominent right. in my mind, which is, would you say that the lack of literacy, because um, there's a figure that says less than up to 60% of Africans are illiterate, would you say that contributes to our inability to engage on an ideological <clears throat> level when it comes to nation building and <clears throat> issues like that? Would you say that contributes to the fact that we gravitate more to these more crude Mm -hmm. you know, divisions rather than looking for what will be in the common good. Okay. We must be very careful, I must, I must be very careful not to uh, appear to, um, to sort of glorify illiteracy. Okay. I'm, I'm not about to do that. Okay. But it's necessary for me to point out that I've interacted with politically minded people on all levels, ideologically driven, erudite, unread, illiterate, uh, if you like, uh, schooled, unschooled, sophisticated, unsophisticated. And I find that political thinking, political awareness is very germane, literally part and parcel You're of human beings. <laughs> yeah, human beings understand when they're being oppressed, when they're being cheated. Okay. Same thing with politics. And so you can have a very shrewd, you know, sharp, acute, analytical mind in any language, you know, literate or illiterate. Literacy helps, of course, but sometimes literacy confuses. <laughs> in other words, uh, I remember one, um, one, it wasn't a politician, it was a businessman in, uh, in Ibadan, who was very much allied to power. Whatever the power was, that's where he wanted to be. He was a businessman. Mm -hmm. And he would say to other people, the problem with you people is you read too, you know, you read too much for your own good. Reading has made you stupid. You know, it's, I think you probably know the person that I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Very wealthy. <laughs> and he was able to prove that he was shrewd without being literate. Okay. And was politically savvy. Yes. But he was he savvy bread was in his own interest. Yes. Anything which worked, he knew exactly how to go there. Aligned. And he would abuse his own Yoruba people, insult them and say, what's wrong with you? This other group, they are made to rule. They are there forever. There's nothing you can do about them. So stop being stupid with all your books. He used to say it openly. But he was a very clever man, very intelligent, very shrewd. 
-hmm. but he had he suffered from a slave mentality. And I said it publicly at the time. Okay. I said the problem with this man is he's a slave. He may be sharp, he may be intelligent, he's a slave. Yeah. So literacy, yes, it's important that we make sure everybody attains is, uh, is equipped, has the same kind of armory to confront whatever new things are brought uh, against him or her. Mm. But literacy is not the, it's not everything. The limiting. It's, it's not the totality. That's the distinction I want to make. I mean, whilst you're, whilst you're making that distinction, someone came to mind who really captured my imagination. During the Shori uh, protest that was truncated to some extent mm -hmm. because he was arrested in advance, mm -hmm. There was a lady who, in her 70s who was selling something and when she saw the people protesting, she asked them what they were protesting about and they told her, they listed some things and she put her thing to one side and joined them. And even though they beat her up, I don't know if you read about this. Lady, I read about it. She said, I will join you again. So that somehow typifies That's what it. you're saying. But I, I want to bring you to the show, Ray Matter. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and, and just look at our human rights record. We're looking at where we are today. And there's some things you said, you know, which I want to refer to and just get... Your take, um, I think you said, the man dies in all who keep silence in the face of tyranny. And you said justice is a prime condition for humanity. So against that backdrop, what's, what's your take on the whole development in the area of Shori's mm -hmm. protest, his arrest, his detention? Please let's hear from you on that. Yeah. I'm very glad that we didn't forget that, that issue because this has been, for me, the most recent and... Um, uh, and disturbing test of this government, you know, which has always shown um, some very dictatorial tendencies. I remember the statement of um, um, Buhari. It wants, if you remember, even the first time he said, "If necessary, I will disobey the the um, instructions of the of the court." In the, in the name of this or security or whatever. Mm. And we said at this time, this is totally unacceptable. And uh, it's not only undemocratic, uh, it's even for me subversive okay. of human, of people's will. Shoury, what did Shoury do? Um, I can tell, he, he even came to my office before the rally. Okay. And uh, I had agreed to, I told him, as I've told people, I said, my marching days are over. You know. I said, but I back any movement dedicated to genuine, positive, and progressive change. Okay. And so I supported the, um, the um, march, which was planned. Yes, it was called revolution now. But revolution, why is anybody scared of the word revolution? Maybe you should have what? called it transformation. Transformation. <laughs> we call this thing. In church, you will hear, it's time we had a revolution. They might add spiritual to it, mm. they might have religious to it, they might tell humanist to it, but revolution is change, drastic change. So why is any government getting nervous about a revolution now uh, movement? What about days of rage? The what, sorry? Days of rage. Days of rage, you know, rhetoric is part and parcel of political movement. Uh, days of rage. Um, solidarity now, Aluta Continua. All movements have their own uh, slogan. Days of Rage, I will admit, is on the provocative side, but at least it didn't say days the nights of long knives, okay. which we know have been used by other people. Okay. The basic thing uh, is that I think Shore did not articulate it, uh, his mission with sufficient clarity. And they give uh, people, and I'm, I'm not talking about government now, I'm mm. talking about those who failed to rise according to his expectations. That he did not take enough time to analyze to them, to expose, to make an exposition of the direction in which this movement was supposed to go. They looked at somebody who just contested an election, you know, and didn't make any headway. And therefore, they looked askance at this dramatic move from a seeming democratic, uh, democratic uh, effort to mass mobilization. And that's why I think he did not gather enough uh, support. But the government had no business, frankly, based on what he had to say 
based on the articulation, even the limited articulation of his goals. For me, it's just overreaction, over the top, to start accusing him of treason. If you have any new things to expose to us, we're waiting for it. But right now, as far as I'm concerned, this was nothing beyond the kind of popular, attempted popular movement to put the government on its toes. And this government, this nation, all of us need really to get on our toes. Disaster is staring at us everywhere. If somebody looks at the beginning of a new democratic um, dispensation, that is the new, uh, the renewal of a mandate which has not proved you know, its mettle, which has not come up to expectations, if a, if a group of people feel, look, before they take over the second time, let's just remind them that we're not fools, we're not passive slaves, that we're not going to take the same thing as we took in the last four years. So the timing itself for me was significant. It was to put the government on its toes, to remind it of its unfulfilled promises, unfulfilled expectations, even a reversal of some of its promises, uh, to say, we are watching, we are waiting. That for me was the meaning of Shawari's movement. And it, it didn't merit being called treason and then he's being locked That's up. Away. And then the disobedience of court orders, the bail, just to give themselves time to slap new charges on him. This, this, we've, we've been through all this nonsense before. So why, you know, why, why, why the repetition? Why the repetition? Same results, same ludicrous uh, self-positioning. Mm. It, it's, it's just not worthwhile. Yes, no, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. I'm maybe looking at another instance that some might call troubling um, because it looks as if um, and I'm referring to Vice President Oshibajo. Mm -hmm. It looks as if he's under siege. I know we talked about the ruling class being united, but it seems that there's some inter-squabble going on. Do you have any insights as to what might be going on there? No, I have none except to just use uh, the Oshibajo case to tell Nigerians to really watch out for fake news. Okay. You know, I was glad to read uh, when Oshimba just said, I'm putting aside my immunity, okay. and anybody who has a case against me, let them come out in the open. There's just too much garbage news out there. The stolen identities, you know, yeah, false, deliberate fabrication. You notice there's a word I'm trying to avoid, hate news, and I'll okay. tell you why I'm trying to avoid okay. it. Because Buhari in his recent statement was lashing out against hate news. Okay. They don't and want to identify want, with that. The next thing they will say, I'm echoing uh, <laughs> <laughs> But there's also hate news uh, and very dangerous anti-social uh, factory, you know, of news going around. Let me give you one very Please. quick instance. I had to write a bank recently and I compel them to take down a uh, um, a billboard they were using to advertise themselves. This billboard contained a supposed statement by me, which I've never in my life ever made. It wasn't the first time I've come across it, and it was just total fabrication. And I, it became really troubling when I saw it. It was at the airport. Oh, wow. Right, yes, Wally Shinka, a quote. So I wrote the bank, and through that action, fortunately, we were able to track down the source of that, that quote. And the source was a blog, a blog, 40 quotes from Professor Wale Shoyinka. Okay. Out of 40, 27 were total fabrication. Oh. Never said anything approaching those 27 in all my life. It's coming out in my next uh, interventions uh, series, which I've been doing, The Republic of Liars. When you get a situation where 40 quotes have been attrib attributed to one human being, and 27 of those are things I never said. The issue is not whether I agree with them or not, or whether I disagree. 
the important thing is I just never said those things. And I challenge, and in, my, in this coming camera, I challenge that blog site to come and give us the source of that. You see, this nation is something drastically wrong when people's identities can be taken in that manner. And so when, uh, it's not the first time they've done it to Oshibajo. Mm. They did it to the governor here of here, Ogun State, which they tried to destroy his family through, you know, uh, totally false and fabricated uh, things. And I can understand when things get to the level, I can understand but not approve. Mm. And quickly say that in these days, these days, one also has to qualify what one says because people just pluck things out. Mm. I could understand the. Um, one of the, I forgot it was the Senate or House of Assembly, going out on a limb to start prescribing um, death penalty for uh, fake news which lead to mayhem. And so, I mean, that's crazy. Mm. That's absolutely crazy. But I could understand the feeling. Because some of these people, if I meet them one on one in a dark corner, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, something might happen. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> so, so I got carried away no, a little no, bit. It's, it's but my sympathies are completely with victims okay. of fake news, of false accusations, uh, which in fact confuses the, the whole issue of genuine corruption and the fight against the way we have been treated by the coalition of the elite corrupt for decades in this country through various governances and which this regime says it's fighting uh, against, but at the same time being exposed you know, on so many levels through so many of its own appointees as being just part and parcel of the same old you know, uh, uh, culture, let me put it that way, mm. because it's become a culture. But because of the fake news which goes on all around, fabricated all the time, uh, people get confused about just who are the real predators mm. in this society. And it's the predators who themselves create this okay. confusion. Oh, interesting. So, so, so we're in a mess. Republic of liars. Republic um, of liars. Just Watch out for the next edition. <laughs> okay, I'll be watching. <laughs> just out of interest, though, just so you can debunk the fake news in our minds, mm. are you saying you don't subscribe to the people who say that he is being uh, embattled, so to speak, because he he looks like he's the next prospective president 20, come 2023. So it would be an attack from the political elites against him. Yeah, pa part of that, um, part of that, uh, this the struggle for that power. A conspiracy theory. <laughs> yes, the preparation. People, one thing about this nation you find is the, the it's a nation of calculators. They're calculating sometimes 10 years ahead. They don't even think of the possibility of certain events happening in the meantime, which just throw out all their calculations. And so calculations lead to intrigues. The intrigues involve what I call dirty tricks. Eliminate those whom you think are a threat. Might be, you know, might be uh, in the running. And these intrigues are carried on on behalf of those who are not even aware okay. of such intrigues, who are not even interested, which then reduces their performance capabilities because they don't want to seem to be, they, they're inhibited, they're crippled even in the present. So you have this vicious cycle in which you not only try to nobble the chances of those who think are threats to your uh, aspirations, you even nobble them in terms of their capacity to perform. So. That's why I was very happy about Oshimajo's uh, um, Putting aside and, his and, immunity. And, and yeah. yes. Facing the battle, <laughs> so to speak. Um, still looking at us as a nation, though, um, where, where we are, and you mentioned that people want to send out a message, possibly, it, it would be a positive thing to send out a message to the administration, current administration, to say mm -hmm. we expect more from you. Mm -hmm. However, some would say that we voted them in not so long ago. We're, we're barely out of our honeymoon period for the second term. Mm. So do you subscribe to the belief that the, the people get the leadership they deserve where, where we are because we, we contributed to it largely? Yes, yes, I agree with you 
And then when you try to mobilize new forces, people say, <laughs> you can't win in this country. People then say, um, oh yes, we know all that was fake. Uh, they're just trying to divide um, the votes. They're not even ashamed to say that. In other words, they have already decided on a block, on a block vote. Mm. And then when you come up and you say, all of you get off the stage uh, and just let's have a new... Um, Alternative. Just, let's just try a totally new direction. Um, then they abandon even their own, uh, their own clamor for change. Change can only come, they feel, through them, through the old brigade. Again, I address this in the new edition of Republic of Lies, in which I found myself, because of some stupid write-up, I was actually accused of trying to split the Igbo vote okay. by supporting a young Igbo man. Can you imagine that? Okay. These are people who say, we need a new vision, we need a new direction. Now you encourage young people to come together and you say, just throw up somebody among you whom we can back. And then if they don't succeed, you say, okay, we'll back one of you whom we think you know, can bring about this change. And the next thing you hear about, oh yes, we know, he's actually working, he was working secretly for that side, and so he threw this one. When I read it, honestly, I wanted to give up on this country completely. <laughs> I just said, I, I'm sick and tired that we can actually, that such people, and, and because we've democratized opinion, of course, internet is there, all kind of garbage is out there, all kind of denigration, of, all part and parcel of preparing again for the next round to say we've got to discredit this particular individual because we think he has too much influence and even if the person is not a politician, he has no ambition himself. They work at eroding, mm. eroding the, the voices of those who, who just think they want to make a change. Mm. I mean, what can be done, really? Because um, one such candidate, um, Mogalu uh, Kinsley, was disappointed. He expressed disappointment, mm. having stood up and maybe felt he had a good chance because he was representing the youth sector, who mm. are the largest sector of our mm. society. He felt that the turnout was so disappointing that it meant that even allegations that the elections were rigged couldn't hold water because he felt, or he said, where more of us, if more of us took the time to show up, then it would be harder to rig the elections. What do you say, um, what's your opinion of the youth and why they appear apathetic in certain areas? You've asked a very difficult question. Um, I try very hard not to be unfair to youth, to the young generation. Uh, but sometimes I find it very difficult um, not to have to admit that um, it's something, um, it's almost like a kind of, uh, that's a new personality, a new Nigerian personality, you know, which has not yet been thoroughly defined and which has been made up um, by historical events. I think there's a level of disillusionment higher in, uh, and, and this one which goes up, this disillusionment goes up year after year as the new generation is disappointed by even those um, whom they felt at least represented the, the more positive side of the elder society. And so you come to a level where it's, look, I just want my slice of the national cake. Mm -hmm. You're quite right about the disappointment of what I call the alternative vote. Yes, we know that they failed to bring out a consensus candidate. But if you add, as you remarked, more or less, you add all the votes garnered by the, shall we say, the new breed, the young generation, the new hopeful. Mm -hmm. If I say I was not disappointed, I was, I'd be lying in my teeth. I was very bit disappointed. Not for a moment, and here again I take to task those who actually, who, actually, who the lazy, I'm sure cynics, who said, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah look, is that all? Is that, is that the vote? And uh, but they didn't even, they never stood a chance. Of course we knew 
none of them stood a chance. But they've got to make a start. They've got to make a beginning. And so you're just going to sit down, fold your hands, and say, the machinery is too heavy for me. I've cited during the time of trying to mobilize them before the last election. I used to bring the example of President Lula to them. I addressed them several times, individually, collectively, many, many venues. I said, let me tell you what President Lula told me about how he won, you know, the trade unionist in Brazil, who's now, who's in problems of his own. But how did he win the election? This outsider, rank outsider, said he printed leaflets. He began early, he printed leaflets, and he would stand at street corners during rush hour and give people these leaflets and say, my name is Lula, I want to be the president, <laughs> the next president of Brazil. This is my manifesto. And he said he went on foot, house to house, and made people begin to think. And I pointed out to them also the Obama phenomenon. Mm. I was teaching in the States at the time. And I saw, saw how from being, ha ha, funny man, the movement began, the change in people's thinking began. And they looked at the past and they said, wait a minute, what this man is saying, the project, the program, which is presenting to us, and the history also, isn't it about time? And we saw how the youth began to work on their parents, on their uncles and aunties, how they used to come together, have meetings, mm -hmm. spread the news, you know, encourage people to think laterally, away from the pattern, the old pattern, racism, etc., marginalization, the think outside the machinery, the well-heeled machinery, and say, wait a minute, let's, let's try this one. Mm. And before you knew where we were, there was a groundswell. And are you telling me such a thing is not possible in this country? Mm. I mean, do we have half a head? Do we have, always have to think of Yoruba block, Hausa block, uh, do we have to think, do we have to follow those who say, if we support this one, it'll be our turn next time, which, was a, which is again going on even right now as I speak to you, which certainly affected even the last elections. I heard it articulated by people from whom I didn't expect to hear such language. But the youth must come together and just say, oh, let's just brush all this aside. And there's enough time. As it, this, you know, one regime is just beginning. Mm -hmm. Let them start working right now, you know. Regroup, rethink. Throw aside their individual ambitions and think collectively for a change. And even if they don't make it this next time, they would have made such a dent that the elections after that, we throw up wonders. But even, why, why the election after the next one? Why not even the next one? They've got to take their courage, they've got to take courage, take their destiny in their own hands. And this is the kind of preaching we did to them uh, at the last uh, yes. elections, and I hope they've taken it to heart and start early, not wait to the last moment. Mm, yes, we can. <laughs> That's what's resounding in my ear. We'll be breaking here in preparation for the final lap on this trilogy of engaging conversations. Look out for part three, where we touch on matters concerning xenophobia, the muscular youth on the plane, Professor Wale Shoinka's dreams for Nigeria, amongst others. I am Ekene Ezeji.